And uh, so we have uh, a lot of the photograph that I have here that I can share with you. Uh, so to look at some of the problems uh, with the trees. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be inevitable. Uh, so the trees will have uh, some problems. Many of them are gonna be natural and uh, most of them are gonna be caused by people uh, somewhere, somehow uh, people are gonna influence a lot in what's happened. And so here is uh, a American sweet gum, the liquid umbar. And when you look at the stem, See, I think I can do it as a slideshow, but I don't want it to move forward. Uh, so yeah, that's what I did not want it. So let's see. Ah, well, just playing like that. So when we have, uh, it's going to ha suffer from a canker. And so obviously when we have some kind of bleeding on a tree, it's going to be something that is not going to be good. Uh, sometimes, like normal wounds, uh, then the wound would happen, the tree is able to heal itself, and the wounding would stop. And that's the end of that. However, there is going to be some perennial wounds that will keep on bleeding year after year after year after year. And so those are the ones that will eventually cause a problem on the tree. Uh, and so what we have here as a way of looking for some of those uh, problems uh, we have the bleeding. We have a bark uh, that is going to be darker in color because it's wet. Uh, and so that is already telling me that there is something different and that's I need to pay attention. And you can see where there's a wet spot. And so this will be a canker that on a yearly basis, it will reactivate. Uh, it's going to be a bacteria that will ooze out uh, bacteria ooze as well as sap and a bunch of other things. Is this a serious problem? It can be uh, because like any diseases, if it's going to dominate the stem, eventually the tree will die. If it's just hitting a branch, that branch will die because it's going to destroy the vascular system and then you're going to have to remove the tree. How does this get infected? Uh, probably through a cut. Uh, we can see that trees in the urban habitat are going to be requiring regular care. So any kind of branch that was pruned uh, when the tree or when the disease was active serves as an infection point or an infection area. Uh, so any kind of wound or uh, also any kind of branch that may be broken. Uh, I've seen people hitting the bark of trees because they're doing some kind of martial arts that's not good. And all of those will kill the vascular system and open up ways for diseases to go in. So begin to look at the different shades in the bark of the tree, because we know and we see where it's going to be natural or uh, the uh, uh, a part of the nature of the tree, but where it is not, uh, then you can definitely say that there's a problem. Now, if you add to the fact that with this canker, there's also going to be a fragrance. There's going to be, I'm going to say like a perfume, Swedish type fragrance. Uh, but when I've gotten very close to it and I keep smelling it, it gives me like a stomach ache. Uh, so it's just, it's, it's a fragrance. Not a bad one, but there's kind of a chemical fragrance associated with it. So then you can use also the smell because that's going to be noticeable from many, many meters away. And then uh, you can say, okay, there's something wrong with this tree. And yeah, it's a canker. Can you treat this? The answer is no. Once the tree is infected with it, there is no way that you can remove the canker. Uh, there's no way that you can spray anything to be able to save the tree. So it's going to be there for the rest of the life of the tree. And that is why preventing preventing something from like this from happening is going to be the best solution. Uh, you can also see a very nice margin. So everything that's within this margin here is going to be already dead. So this is a, like a dead area. So probably the bacteria keep on walking and it's going to keep moving up the tree. And so the tree will continue to grow. And as it grows, that area is going to become a more, almost like a depression on the tree. 
So there is a, a margin where you see some healthy tissue from the tree and the dead decay canker area and the same thing over here. So you can look for some of those things. Uh, we've seen fire blight before. This is not new. It's another bacterial infection, again, transmitted by bees. Uh, bacteria are not going to be too uh, strong uh, for a few exceptions. Uh, most of them will require either a natural way to go into the trees or the assistance of a person or some kind of wound to infect uh, a tree. Uh, fire blight, uh, it's going to use the natural nectar glands that are found uh, on the flowers. And that is why the bees are going to be one of the worst vectors, uh, the vector being the organism that is going to transmit the diseases from plant to plant. So that would be a vocabulary word, the vector. People can be vectors because people can transmit uh, the diseases. And uh, the response of the plant to the disease is going to be known as the symptom. What is the plant exhibiting? What symptom is the plant exhibiting? And so here we definitely see some flagging or dieback. So that is the symptom of the plant. And uh, where the disease infected the plant, uh, the area, whether it be that piece of the stem, the flowers for uh, the fire blight, that is going to be known as the infection court. That is where the two organisms kind of get came together. Uh, the infection infected the plant, and that's going to be known as that. So you have infection court, you have the symptoms, and you have the vector, and uh, those are going to be important for you to be aware of uh, as we keep on talking about diseases. So in this case, fire blight, the bacteria is going to secrete uh, enzymes. It's going to secrete toxins. And uh, the toxins are going to then very quickly kill the plant. And so that's another thing that you have to kind of start thinking about how is this affecting the plant? How is this organism, this pathogen affecting or killing the plant? Uh, with the canker, it's just going to be there. It's going to eat a little bit. It's going to be active for a while. It's going to exude those uh, the uh, watery uh, exud exudates. Uh, with fire blight, it's going to decimate the plant. So it's going to send a bunch of toxins into the plant as soon as it moves inside. And the toxins will very quickly kill every single stem, every single leaf, everything. And so as the bacteria then advances, it's going to start to feed on those dead tissue or the dead cells of the plant. So this bacteria feeds on decay, feeds on dead cells. And so that's why it's going to very quick, kill them very quickly. Uh, and before the plant has a kind of chance to stop it. And that's going to be whether the plant is going to be uh, resistant or not. Uh, in this case, it is very susceptible. And so it's just going to decimate big branches and big leaves. And so here, the symptom is flagging. And also as a symptom, uh, you're going to see the leaves. And this will happen because the leaves will kill very quickly. And that's why they do not have a chance to detach. And you will see them hanging. Uh, so when you hear the word blight, it means a very rapid death. And so this is called fire blight. Fire because it kind of looks like it was burned. And blight because it was killed very quickly. So the young twigs are going to twist and curl. Uh, and uh, here's a different photograph. And here's when it was it's barely affecting the, the plant. So did it come to the flower? The answer is no, not necessarily does it have to go through the flower because the bacteria is also going to overwinter uh, or just sleep in some of the cankers. And if some other organism happens to touch it and then move on to the plant, as long as there is natural openings, the bacteria can go in. Uh, and so we know that there's also uh, lenticels uh, uh, all around the stems, that's where the stems will breathe through, that the bacteria could potentially infect those areas. And so here is a very young twig that got infected uh, several days ago. Uh, and we see it, it's still some kind of green. And we see green towards the tip. And then we see green towards the back. And right in the middle, somewhere, maybe somewhere here, that's where the bacteria 
got deposited or infected and it started killing on both sides. And once that is killed, no, uh, no more vascular system to give water to the tips. And that's why this tip of the branch is wilting and it's gonna die and eventually more will follow. Uh, but you see the leaves here are also now droopy. There's no water. And you can see the beginning of just the decay as it advances. So uh, you have the beginnings of the disease and later on you'll see those branches and leaves that are completely dead. Uh, there's also going to be the wood rotting fungi and we'll see several examples of what happens here. Uh, and this is called, probably going to be the worst one, in a, not in a bad way, uh, the worst in that you don't see the problem. So you don't see the problem. The only thing that you're gonna see will be the conchs. But we know that when there is a conch, which is the fruiting body for this fungi, now it's a disease caused by a fungi, it's feeding off of something. Uh, the conchs are gonna have a natural job of decomposing wood. Uh, so that's their job. So when there's a dead tree, they're gonna go there and decompose it to make sure that it's doesn't stay there and also uh, recycle all the vitamins and minerals. But when the tree is still alive, still standing, the bark could be intact, the vascular system could be intact, but inside it could be completely hollowed out and completely rotten. Now, if everything else is good, the tree can still live for many years, but like Murphy Law says, if something could go wrong, uh, the right wing comes along, then the tree may fall or snap because at the end of the day, it's going to have a hollow center, which should have been protecting the tree, but it is not. And the only way for us to know that there might be some hollowed nest inside or some cavities is by finding the fruiting bodies, uh, finding the conchs, and then you know that there is a fungi living inside. There's going to be different forms. Uh, here is uh, a tree that was dead, and you can see the conch just fruiting off of that. So every single year, this fungi will send millions upon millions of spores. Uh, they're going to fly into the air, and they are going to then eventually land on a wound of the tree or an open wound, and that's where they're going to infect it. So there's no way you can protect the tree from that except by minimizing the wounds. And also, when uh, for this fungi to get hold or start growing, they're going to require humidity. And that is why uh, we tend to avoid pruning when the plant uh, or when there's rain in the forecast, uh, or if it's raining or if it's very humid, we tend to avoid it because that environment is going to favor the fungi that are going to be up into the air. So we cut a branch, it's fresh wound, fungi are in the air, they land, there's lots of humidity, very easy for them to become established and infect the plant. So we have uh, here uh, in uh, the brown underneath it, those are the spores. Uh, millions upon millions are released every single year. Uh, there is another bacteria uh, infection that is affecting olive trees. Uh, that is going to be scorch. Uh, it started with oleanders, and when it started you know, with oleanders, uh, I think in the early of the century, uh, nobody paid attention because it was oleanders. It's just a plant that was going along the freeway, so who cares about them? There's no money behind them. Uh, but then other plants started to really become uh, susceptible to it, uh, and it became noticeable when uh, they started discovering or they discovered that it was affecting grapes. Uh, it is a disease that is native to California. However, many of the trees that were here were not being infected by the disease because there was no insects around that would transmit. Uh, the vector was not here. Uh, it is known as Pierce's disease in grapes. Uh, but when we're looking at the ornamentals, it is known as scorch. Uh, and so it killed oleanders and then it started to be discovered in many, many other plants. Uh, and so it's affecting liquid umbars and its biggest damage is going to be noticed on olives. 
So here we have the same thing as the fire blight. You have a flagging or a scorching. Uh, you have a bacteria that is going to clog the vascular system. Uh, so it's literally going to live in the vascular system, feed off of uh, the cells in there. And when the numbers become really high, they're going to clog the vascular system to where water is not going to be able to reach the top of the branches. And so you have an area that was clogged somewhere at the bottom. And so that is no longer feeding that vascular system to this branch. And that's why that individual branch will die. Eventually, as the bacteria moves and grows, another branch will die and then another and then another and then another. It is also not uncommon to see more suckering because the tree will respond by making more branches, more leaves, and that's gonna come from the base. And so what we are running with the problem is that you're not gonna see many olive trees as trees anymore. They're gonna be just a shrub. Uh, and so the branch gets removed, now the tree gets a little bit lower, then the next one that gets lower, then the next one, and then eventually the entire top will die and all you're gonna get are the uh, suckers. And those suckers will eventually succumb in a couple of years. And so what we, what we knew as a tree will in a couple of years be grown as a shrub because any height that it gets will eventually get killed. It's not gonna go away, it's here, it's affecting hundreds of trees now, so we can add it to the problem of uh, other things that you're gonna come or deal with when it comes to tree problems. So it's called that scorch disease and uh, it's affecting others. And we'll see later on because it's, I've seen trees decline uh, severely. Uh, a few other things, uh, this one looks like a fungi, but it is not. Uh, just uh, as you start to now look at trees, don't think that everything is bad. Uh, so here is a polymer that is used to exclude bees. So honeybees have a natural tendency of making their hive in hollow areas on top of trees because it's safety. And so obviously we have now the Africanized honeybee that is not good or could be a little more defensive. And so once they get rid of the hive, then they can plug the cavity with uh, this polymer that will exclude the bees. Is it 100% effective? No, bees can still dig through it uh, because when there is already a hive that got established, there's some pheromones, uh, chemicals in there that will let other bees know that there's a hive there, a potential house. So if you exclude or kill this colony, another one can move right in because there's a lot of swarming. So nothing more than a foam-like material uh, to cover the holes or plug the holes, uh, the cavities for this. Is that a big problem? No, I would be more concerned with the cavity. How severe is that than the honeybees? Uh, we have here some of those uh, barriers <laughs> uh, in the roots because uh, this is gonna be the precursor to a lot of the root pruning. So is root pruning good for the tree? The answer is no, because there is gonna be a lot more pathogen, a lot more diseases within the soil. The ones in the air are one, the ones in the soil are gonna be a lot more. And so by cutting the roots, yes, you are preventing uh, the breakage of the cement walkway for a while until new roots develop, uh, but you're also creating a very nice big wound and then you add soil to it or close, uh, make it, bring it into contact with soil, then you get even worse problems. Uh, but here's just a barrier that is already being pushed by the tree. Uh, many trees will have some kind of gumming. So the sap can become like a gum. And in most healthy trees, this is very important. So if an insect happens to begin to eat or make a hole into the tree, then the natural defense of the tree is to bleed out some of this gum that will eventually become very hard and it will gum or close the jaws of the insect or it's going to literally uh, encase the insect in that amber like material uh, or in this gum that will eventually salify and kill the insect and kind of close the wound. So this is very important. It's part of the defense of the tree. However, in order for this to be very, very effective, the tree needs to be in good health. The water needs to be plentiful because the water is gonna be necessary for creating this gum. 
uh, and uh, uh, the health of the tree needs to be there. So this is why a lot of the trees that are under some kind of stress are going to be preferred by the insects because they know that the vascular system is not going to be at its prime. It knows that there's already some kind of problem that is going to be minimizing the, vas uh, the immune system and the sap might not flow as well. And so a healthy tree can defend itself, a stressed out tree cannot. So to see something like this on the tree, it's, it's okay to some degree. We know that the tree is defending itself. However, this individual, here's the gum uh, that uh, you see. Uh, there's a gum that became solid. Uh, and uh, this individual has uh, a lot of them. And this, almost the entire stem is uh, being covered by it. So although it's trying, if the number of insects uh, it becomes very high, then the trees, the immune system can definitely fail and the tree will succumb. Uh, and here we have some more of the gumming. Uh, so this, to see it is good, but to see a lot of it is not good because then the tree that tells you that there's probably other problems with the trees. Uh, here's a, a very serious wound. Uh, so what we can kind of diagnose here is that this was a very large branch that kind of either fell or was cut uh, later on. We have a nice shape, a heart shape on uh, the healing tissue. But this type of wounds require many, many years for them to heal. In the process, this interior hardwood, dead wood, is exposed to 101 different types of uh, uh, wood rotting fungi. So minimizing or avoiding the severe cuts is going to be very, very important. Uh, There's a different view. Can this heal? Yes, over time it has been doing it. Uh, but when you cut a branch at a younger age, it'll heal much quicker and it's not going to be as severe. Uh, then you're going to have also an invitation for termites. Uh, the termites are not going to feed on the healthy tree. They are going to be only feeding on the dead wood. And the same thing goes for the wood rotting fungi. They are not going to attack the living portion of the tree. They're just going to be feeding off of the dead wood that's inside. However, if the tree is under a lot of stress, if the immune system is very, very low, if there's other problems associated with the tree, then the termites and or the wood rotting fungi have been known to take advantage of a very sickly tree and they will begin to attack and feed off of uh, the living portion. But in most cases, they will not, but there's always the exception. So you're inviting termites. If you have an open wound, you're inviting fungi, uh, wood rotting fungi. And eventually the tree will succumb. So we'll see uh, this very typical image of uh, the wood rotting. And when we're looking at wood rotting uh, fungi, uh, there's going to be two types. There's going to be the dry rot and the wet rot. Uh, and they're going to behave a little bit differently. Uh, sometimes uh, one of them will uh, break into uh, like segments or chunks. Uh, and that is because uh, so that fungi will feed off of the lignin that kind of holds uh, the wood together. Uh, and uh, uh, the other one, if it doesn't break into chunks, is going to break into more like uh, uh, strips. So it's either blocks or strips. Uh, I think the wet rod is going to be stripped and the dry rod is going to be cubes or little segments. Uh, and uh, we always going to see the rod beginning in the center. Keep in mind, that is the oldest part of the tree. That is the area that is going to be dead. And so any infection will begin to feed right at the center and gradually work its way out towards mm -hmm. the living area. And so here we have already something that ate it a while back and started feeding on it. And uh, you can see that it's gradually breaking and cracking and uh, the lignin will be gone and eventually other organisms are gonna begin to feed and eventually the tree will die. Here's a, an ash tree. And I think this might be somewhere here in Long Beach, I forget the area. The tree was very tall and it looked very happy and healthy. 
but the base is telling me otherwise. There is a very large conch. And you can cut the conch, that's not gonna help. You can treat the conch, that's not gonna help. The problem is a systemic problem inside the tree that you cannot do anything to it. Can this tree be happy? Yes. Can this tree be safe? Yes. Can this tree eventually fall? Yes. When? We don't know. And that is why many municipalities were simply opt for removing the tree. So here I see a conch. If I were to bring this to the attention of the municipality, if this was in a park, they would take the very quick way out, just get rid of the tree so that we don't have any liability. Uh, so again, they don't want to take a chance, but this tree could be safe. It could be happy. It could be living here for many years. How can you detect whether or not this tree could be happy? Uh, there are different methods. So uh, there is a coring type method where you can drill a hole into the tree. Obviously, you're going to be making a wound. And you can see the thickness of the living healthy tissue wood versus how much decay is inside. So that will give you an estimate. Now, if you don't want to create that wound, there are now some radio or some other method that you can, I guess, using sound waves uh, that you can use to kind of give you an estimate of uh, the living or the hardwood. Uh, some people take a mallet, uh, like a rubber mallet, and they hit it, hit the tree. It may sound hollow, and they're gotten good at kind of estimating uh, which, uh, uh, how much of that uh, is still living or, or dead. And so there's different methods. I think as technology gives us better uh, abilities, we'll be able to then determine which much more precision, how much of it is alive and dead, and then we can make an S a decision as to whether or not we should remove the tree. Uh, and so here's uh, the conch. And I know that there's a lot of rot inside, but you do not see any of that uh, from the outside or there's no evidence of it. Uh, I mentioned with the eucalyptus, uh, the blue gum, uh, the leaf beetle. So again, I couldn't find that in class, but here it is in photograph. So this is the leaf beetle. So it feeds on the leaf. This is the uh, underside. And then here's the upper side. So when it was sleeping. So leaf eating, uh, this is the nocturnal. There's also now a day uh, or diurnal individual. And then we have the bark beetles or the beetles that are going to feed on uh, the vascular system of the tree. This one happens to be the eucalyptus longhorn beetle. And so once again, stress, stress, stress is going to be the main factor. So the female beetle is going to be looking around for trees that are under stress because uh, she will need to lay her eggs on a tree to feed its young. And it is very common for her to find a tree and under stress, she will be, uh, make the hole uh, and burrow uh, its way into the tree. They have very strong jaws that can uh, cut wood. And then what happens is that once she finds a tree that is suitable, it's under stress, she makes a hole, then she's going to send out a pheromone. She's going to let every other beetle in the neighborhood know that there is, a, for a lack of a better term, it's a party happening. There's food. Uh, and so that's going to bring every beetle from miles away to this tree where they would mate uh, and many females will lay their eggs. And then that's going to overwhelm the tree. So that's how they communicate. So they have to find it. Then they send out the invitation and then they all congregate and uh, lay the eggs and then they're gone. So then what happens is that you can see here, somewhere here, where the tunnels are very narrow. That is the site where the females lay their eggs. And once they lay the eggs, she may go to the entrance and kind of die to protect the entrance from having any other animal going there and eating the egg. And so when the eggs hatch, uh, they are going to be very small. They are then going to begin to feed on the vascular system of the plant. It's very soft. It's very nutritious. They're not going to go into the wood or they're not going to go into the bark. So right behind the bark, feeding on the vascular system. And every single bite, it's going to destroy the vascular system, causing a problem. But as they grow and 
keep on getting bigger, you're going to see the gradual widening of the tunnel uh, until they are very wide. By that time, this uh, uh, insect is, has gotten really big. Now they can feed in uh, have bigger branches, and now they are going to be much more problematic. And so if the insect is able to girdle or eat the entire perimeter of the branch, then that separates the vascular system, that branch is dead. If it happens to the stem where they eat the entire girth of the stem or the surrounding vascular system, the entire tree is dead. Uh, and so we have this bark beetle, this is the uh, eucalyptus longhorn beetle, that is going to cause this. It's another problem with eucalyptus, but that's the behavior. And once they become the adult, they're going to go out, find a tree, and begin the cycle all over again. And this is the culprit. Uh, this is a flat-headed borer. So you notice the head is right here. And you see the very dark mandibles, the jaws, because they have to be very strong. Uh, they have to be able to bite through the wood and chew and eat. Uh, and they're creating those tunnels. Uh, here's just in comparison for a, with a dime. So you can see the scale. And here's uh, where I mentioned before in a different class that there's going to be uh, the beetles or the uh, bark beetles that are going to be packers or kickers. So the frass, uh, the insect poop, uh, in this case is going to be a packer. So it's going to be, as it's feeding on one side, it's going to be pooping and kind of keeping it inside the tunnel. And it's a protection for them, uh, but that could be used as a diagnose. Uh, and so that's how it's going to move, keep making a tunnel, and then packing uh, some of the, uh, the frass in the behind them. So this is the eucalyptus longhorn beetle. Uh, it's a bark beetle, and it's also a flat-headed beetle uh, or grub, as you can see right here. Uh, there's going to be different psyllids, and we keep going back to eucalyptus because those, those got decimated by psyllids not too long ago. Uh, so this is uh, the red gum psyllid, uh, just, just gigantic numbers that overwhelm the tree. So if the numbers get really high, uh, yeah, the tree is not going to survive. It's somebody feeding on you 24 hours a day, and that's going to be millions of insects. Uh, you're also not going to survive. Having million insect, uh, mosquitoes feed on you at once is not going to be pretty. Uh, and this is what's going to happen. Entire trees that would just die very quickly uh, because they got overwhelmed. So these are some of the blue gums in a park several years ago. Uh, and then uh, if we go back to the wood rotting, it is going to be an entire process. So it's not just uh, the fungi just, oh, yeah, here's uh, some dead wood. I'm going to eat it. Uh, the wood has to go through a preparing or a process of being prepared. So we see here a nice newly cut uh, ficus. And then we see right out of the center, we see this darker patch uh, right here. So what is happening, uh, the very first culprits that are going to start to eat on the wood is going to be bacteria. So, but they're not going to eat the lignin or the wood, but they are going to prepare the wood for the other organisms. The bacteria are just going to be able to digest some of the smaller, softer particles, but in the process, they have already started the digesting process of some of this wood. And so that is now going to be preparing it so that when the fungi get there, they'll be able to break it down quicker. They'll be able to not work as hard and they can take better advantage of uh, the situation. So it is a working relationship between fungi and bacteria. And it's not just, oh, here's the wood, let me eat it. There's a preparation cycle that happens uh, in order for the wood to be able to be digested by the fungi. And so here's uh, the close up of that. So you see how the bacteria is moving from the center, just kind of like oozing its way towards one side. And here you can see where it was coming and they have not touched the one in the back. And that's gonna be the natural kind of pattern of bacteria. They're not gonna grow in a nice circular pattern. It's just gonna grow one direction. And here's the borderline. Uh, so we have the margin uh, below this line. You can see very nice, happy, healthy wood. And then you have the borderline where the bacteria is currently eating. It's a little bit lighter in color or kind of starting to eat. 
And then behind it, you already see some of the wood that is much, much darker. There's some bacterial compounds in there, some uh, 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 digestive enzymes, and also it's changing the color of the wood uh, in this case. So there's a margin that you can see where this uh, action is taking place. Uh, and here's uh, just the vascular system and just a healthy wood. I think that's photograph. And there's a different view of that. So we have an infection here, but we have a secondary one right here. So you see a different grouping of bacteria kind of doing a different action. Again, they're just preparing the wood. Uh, and you, know, you might see a few more throughout this area here, different ones. Uh, so that's what we're seeing. And this one already met, but it's still uh, working on the other direction. So a lot of things are happening right here. Uh, you may not realize. And so that's going to lead to something like this, uh, where the center is just going to rot very quickly, and then it's going to eventually progress to the other sides. And here you can see the boundary. So this is definitely a dry rot. So you see very large clumps uh, of it, and you can see the boundary where it's already been almost rotted, falling apart, and it's still gradually eating. And then you see it here where the fungi is has this borderline. So that's already been digested or working on it and it's working towards the edge. So you see a beautiful margin right there. Uh, and a different view of uh, this uh, situation right here as it rots. And in a different tree, uh, again, you see a beautiful margin right here. Uh, this one in a nice circular pattern towards one side. Uh, and there's uh, the edge uh, or the margin of those organisms. Uh, and then we have something like this, where it's like, why is this tree still standing? Why is it here? Uh, it's about 90% uh, dead. Uh, and the only reason, uh, corrupted poke photograph, the only reason why there's some greenery is because there is a connection to the vascular system here. So somehow this would be most likely an infection from the roots that destroyed the vascular system and it gradually went up or it could have been some kind of uh, tear. So something, a branch fell, was dropped, and it tore down or tore the, vascu the skin, the bark, and that's never going to heal. Uh, but as long as there is a connection, some kind of vascular system still connected, the tree can still live. It's never going to reach its full potential, but it's still going to live. Or in this case, if you ask me, I love trees, I like trees, I want to save every tree, but there's a point where, you know what, I think we need to move you along and maybe we can get a better tree that, or a younger tree that's going to look even better. So on the back, it looks good. If I see it from this angle, I don't see any problem. But if I see it from this angle, I see a lot of big problems. So again, it's hard to show this photo. Hey, tell me how's the health of this tree? Oh, this tree looks healthy. How, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. So look at the entire stem because uh, different views will have uh, different areas. Uh, there's going to be certain types of galls. So this will be another problem. So tumors on plants. Uh, here's uh, some tumors that will develop on uh, our Brisbane box. Uh, this are come, going to be caused by bacteria. There's going to be bacteria that li lives in the soil. And if they happen to infect through a wound, they are going to then create tumors on a plant. Are these tumors deadly? Uh, the answer is no, not on a plant. They don't have a closed system like we do for a human, an animal that has a closed system. A simple tumor can cause really serious problem. On a plant, they don't because they don't have a closed system. So they can just isolate uh, that area and uh, um, move the vascular system in a different direction and keep on living. Uh, so this is not a problem. You'll see them. Many trees will have them. Uh, just another example of uh, the wood rotting uh, that I've just come across whenever I see that. Uh, what's a problem here? Not a disease. This is a tree that has been kept tied down for uh, much longer than it should. Uh, the wires, uh, when it was young, uh, they were never removed. Eventually, the tree will grow around them, and uh, it's going to be part of the tree. Is this detrimental to the tree? 
The answer is not necessarily, but it is causing a weakness. So now there's a weak point in the tree, in the stem. And so if the right wing comes along, it could snap the tree in half. Uh, or if somebody pushes it, it could break very, very easily. So it creates a weak point that will definitely cause a problem to the tree. But itself, the wire being embedded is not going to be a problem. Uh, what's the problem here at the base? This is the weed whacker or the cultivator. So we have the grass very close to the trunk. Grass and trees do not go well. Uh, the trees are going to always lose. Uh, and so the constant use of the weed whacker around the tree to keep the uh, grass low is going to cause a problem. The vascular system is going to be destroyed all around the tree and the tree will die. So not good to have this problem. It's not a disease, it's a cultural problem. A very different tree here, uh, just uh, more rotting and you can see acting a little bit differently. Uh, another wound, this one not healing properly, looks like a sycamore. It already has rot inside, uh, probably water accumulated, some debris. It already looks kind of moldy, not healthy, not happy, not good. Uh, and it's also getting some kind of bleeding here, maybe some of the water. Uh, here's a Chinese elm, and these are by El Dorado Park around that area. And I put in a Floyd uh, taking photographs because there's a very high gall on top of the trees. And normally the galls are going to be somewhere at the base, maybe the roots, maybe it's a couple of inches from the ground. But sometimes if they manage to get up to the top of the tree, if there's a wound, they can infect it. And I think that's what happened here. That could have also been a bird that had the infection on their feet and then they clawed a tree. I don't know. Maybe the wind. Uh, but it's a, it's a very nice gall. So if you are around that area, look up. Uh, and uh, I got, got some nice photographs. So nothing more than just the bark and the stem just growing without any controlled, creating a tumor. And not detrimental, not deadly to the plant, uh, but it's kind of interesting to see uh, this problem. And it's almost going all the way around uh, the stem. So just a very little section that is has been affected by it. Uh, so there's a, a different one. So it's, it's, it's out there. Uh, and there's photographs. Uh, and then I was interested, wow, 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 one of those nice round holes on this tree. Uh, so I guess uh, when people don't want to deal with the stump, because that's going to be another problem when the tree dies, uh, the stump will remain. Uh, and it's going to be a very long time before it rots. Uh, and you can use a stump grinder, which is a machine that kind of uh, shaves off the bar, the tree, the stump, and it goes a little bit deep. Uh, but also they are their products uh, that help to rot it or break down the stump a lot quicker. Or uh, people who do not want the tree to re-sprout uh, will drill holes and then add some Roundup, add some chemical, add something else to get rid of the stump. So that's what's happening here. So the hole is very nice. It's kind of interesting. Uh, it's just the action of people. Uh, you can see the chainsaw. They did some cut with the chainsaw here. Uh, but they just don't want the stump to grow back. And so that's why they put these holes uh, to help it along. Uh, another very serious uh, tree, and this is a ficus, as a street tree. Uh, and uh, you can see this uh, front area is dead. Uh, so it's just living wood. We can see the living portion here trying to heal. So we see a beautiful margin between the dead and the living. Uh, and uh, again, the tree has had some abuse, probably a lot of abuse. Uh, and uh, over time, it just wasn't able to heal. The top is dead. So the only few branches that are left are on one side because that is where the living component is going to be. And those are just the ones that are able to feed on them or be fed by the tree or be supported by the tree. So this is not good. Uh, to have something this big and as a street tree without any living section in probably more than 50% is not good. So just that back area, so it's alive and this area is dead. Uh, and even on the healthy side, there's been some abuse 
so a lot of wounds, uh, a lot of other uh, signs. Uh, and palm trees, uh, we keep saying palm trees are wonderful. They uh, don't really have a lot of problems, but that's not always the case. So in a right windstorm, I came across this one. It's like, wow, I rarely see palms just snapping in half and dying. So like, okay, let's find out what's wrong with it. What happened? So I can see some rot internal. So we can see the nice, healthy, uh, light brown, tan color of uh, the tissue. And then on the left, we have some necrotic areas, some dead areas. Uh, and I can see problems here. Uh, I can see some holes. So most likely at some point in time, somebody use uh, the climbing spurs and they're very commonly used with palms. So they are big spikes that people put on their shoes or on their foot. So as they climb, they're gonna drive those spikes into the tree. So, is it detrimental to the palm? The answer is in most cases, no. Uh, they're trying to move away from using them because uh, every single time somebody climbs it, there's new wounds being inflicted. In this case, one of those wounds happened to be infected and uh, it led to the demise of this palm. Uh, so when we look at uh, the stem that fell down over the house, yeah, we can see kind of probably where the entry point was and uh, we can see the gradual uh, feeding uh, of the fu fungi and or the bacteria combined uh, and uh, this case more than half of the stem was already dead uh, at least in this section and the right wing came along and whoop uh, snapped the palm in half and that's what we have so yes palm can also rot and uh, they could have a serious problem if they're very tall uh, so avoid using those uh, climbing spurs or next time you go see big palms, see if you can see those spurs because they kind of both sides leading up. Uh, there's a different fungi infection called a peach leaf curl. Uh, it only happens on peach. It's a fungi. It usually starts in early spring when the new leaves are emerging. This is more of an aesthetics. It does not really affect the tree that much. Uh, and it's not detrimental, it's just a leaf change color, becomes kind of reddish. It's actually very nice, uh, but it, they get deformed, but people kind of freak out when they see it. So peach leaf curl, that could happen. Here's a different photograph uh, for that. And just a stump with a beautiful uh, oyster mushroom. I mean, those are edible. So, <laughs> so people will often look for trees. Uh, sometimes they like a specific tree because they can inoculate them with a specific fungi spore and they can farm their own uh, fungi. So this was in the wild, but I was uh, just happy to see it. It's just doing its job. The tree is already dead. It fell, uh, they brought it down and the tree fungi is just doing its job in decomposing it. Uh, here's a different fungi uh, just growing out of the base. So start looking for all this fungi uh, because it's gonna be plentiful, very different. Uh, and almost every single tree will have it. And this one was weird. So it is coming out of the roots. So here the tree broke, the roots broke through the cement and just on the edge, there was this uh, fungi growing out of the roots. Like, oh, that's something that you don't see too often. Uh, but I, I have a few photographs, I might be one later on. And then uh, a couple of other leaf galls. I mentioned the galls before on, uh, the California uh, populus uh, poplar uh, or uh, pop populus fremonti, uh, Fremont cottonwood. Uh, so this is what's going to happen. So now it's an insect, an insect that is going to lay the eggs on the margin of the leaves. This one prefers the margin. And uh, you're going to get some tiny tumors, tiny galls uh, that will later on uh, emerge uh, an insect out of them. So just aesthetic problem, not a serious uh, one. Uh, but here it was very high numbers. Again, the leaves will drop, it will, will come and uh, they will get infected. But this is just the nature of the beast uh, to have these galls. I also mentioned anthracnose uh, as a disease, fungal disease on sycamores and a few other plants will get it. But this is, uh, I think I shared this, some of these photographs. 
uh, where the leaves is just distorted. It'll drop in the summer when it's not supposed to. New ones will come out. Uh, but we have yet to see a sycamore die out of this unless they're really stressed because now you could have a problem with uh, the bark beetle and anthracnose, no leaves, uh, taking resources, eventually uh, killing the tree. Uh, the fungus, chicken of the desert. So this is it's going to come uh, pretty soon. So this is a fall uh, fruiting fungi. Uh, later on, we're going to see carob tree, uh, Ceratonia siliqua. Uh, and they are all infected with this fungi. So I can guarantee you that 99.9% .9 of all the trees that are out there in the city of Long Beach are infected with this uh, great fungi. So here's a carob tree, uh, a branch broke, a branch uh, ripped some of the bark, it got infected, and uh, here's the fungi growing out. Uh, so we'll see it, it's a fall plant. Uh, I mentioned before the cellets, uh, so the first one that I showed you was uh, the red gum psyllid. Uh, then later on, a different one came up. And this one is called the, the fishbone psyllid. So what happens with the psyllid is that they are going to create a home out of the honeydew or their, uh, their poop. And those are going to be known as lerps. Uh, and so with this one that affects uh, the lemon scented eucalyptus that we'll do later on, it's kind of shaped like a, the bones of a fish. Uh, and so they will use this as a home. It has an opening, so they go in and out. And they underneath there, in the protection of this lerp or this house, they'll feed on the tree. So this one came later. So first one affected a few eucalyptus, then this one affected a few others, and then there's more coming that will affect the rest. And so here's when it's a very serious infection. So eucalyptus leaves completely covered with uh, some of these lerps. Uh, so we'll get to see this ones later on. Uh, so that's something that you can look for if you're gonna be looking at eucalyptus or growing eucalyptus or hope to see it in the future. Uh, so here's uh, just a, a tree that I found. Uh, I think this is South Central Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, from this photograph, it doesn't look bad. However, when you look at it very closely, this is the close up. I see a lot of bleeding. And so I mentioned some of the bleeding is the response of the tree. Some, a little bit is not bad. However, this is very serious. There are also a lot of holes. So something is definitely attacking this tree. So all of these holes that you see here, those are the holes from the bark beetle. So they are gonna be very small. The tree is trying to defend itself, uh, but it's being overwhelmed in this case. And I don't think the tree was gonna make it for too long, uh, but the entire stem was covered with these holes. And then uh, a few areas that had the gum, sorry, crystallized. And here you can see the gum dripping and almost every inch will eventually be covered by a hole. So once the adults go in, they'll make the hole, they may plug it uh, by their own, with their own body, or when the young ones are already uh, mature, they will come out and they'll dig up or eat uh, a hole and it, it's way out of the tree. So again, this is where the numbers of insects are so high that it's gonna overwhelm the tree and the tree's fighting, but it's just not gonna happen. Uh, so here as you can see, just the holes and sap and a bunch of other things. So not a good thing to see. And looking up, you can see the every single branch uh, where the sap has been bleeding and now kind of gumming. And you can see kind of like a trail, a river of sap. Uh, so those are, that's not good. Uh, and then uh, I mentioned uh, earlier with uh, magnolias there's a new pest or relatively new pest it's called uh, the uh, tulip tree uh, scale and uh, this is it and unfortunately it's affecting every type of magnolia tulip trees and lirodendron and a bunch of other plants that are in the magnolia family uh, and uh, not too long ago there was an article in the press telegram or one of those uh, instagram press telegram and they were talking about what can people do for helping these trees because we are losing magnolias in city of Long Beach left and right because of this problem. 
when you walk underneath the magnolia, if you see splashes of wetness underneath it, it's coming from this tree, it becomes very sticky and it's very ugly and they can succumb and kill magnolia trees very, very quickly. It's just sheer numbers. So when you see this tiny branch, every single inch is covered by a scale, which means that water is not being allowed to go to the leaves and eventually that's gonna die. Uh, and so unless we find a cure, this will continue on uh, killing magnolias or members of the magnolia family. And uh, we might need to help, uh, replace them with something else. So here's a different branch and you can see the scales at different ages. So these big clumpy ones are the adults. And then throughout this tiny uh, limb, you have uh, the different scales at different ages. So as they grow, they will eventually become big. And then I took one of them off and I can see that underneath them, there are a lot of eggs. So each individual can lay over 10,000 eggs inside them. And those will become individual insects that will crawl out and find a nice branch to feed on. And that's where they're gonna be a problem. So they are overwhelming all the magnolias. We can add the stress of all this water conservation since magnolia like water and now we are treating them as drought tolerant. So not having water or getting under the water stress and it's gonna make them more susceptible to it and uh, it's gonna eventually succumb them. So my recommendation when they ask me, so what can people do is just keep your plants happy, keep watering them keep them happy so that they'll be able to tolerate all this uh, intense feeding of insects. Uh, so that's magnolia or a tulip tree scale that is becoming a much more worse problem. And you just see it's another branch. This incidentally are my magnolia trees in front of the shade house that I think they're dying now. Uh, and then uh, I was, I went to a conference and I saw this eucalyptus and like I saw underneath it, it's like, wow, what is this, all this white stuff underneath it? Hmm, never seen that before. And then I got close to it and like, ooh, that's not like any fungi could be powdery mildew. Uh, and the answer is uh, it's uh, bird guano. So it's bird droppings. So what is happening is that every night there's probably a flock of birds that goes to the top of the trees. That's where they roost, that's where they sleep and they will poop out uh, throughout the night. Uh, and so we can see that it's in very large number uh, and that makes this shrub look kind of like a, there's a problem with it, but it's in fact just uh, bird poop. But it could be uh, seen as a disease or powdery mildew or something else, but no, it's just bird poop. Uh, and then I mentioned many times about uh, the bark beetle uh, that is hitting uh, the, a lot of the trees. And so here is uh, the hole and, uh, for that beetle. And there's a very tiny, tiny beetle. Uh, so it's almost the size of a smaller than a grain of rice. Uh, and so its face is gonna be looking down. And uh, this is, uh, the one that is killing hundreds of trees and is gonna kill a lot more. The one that tried to find a, a cure for it, but they're failing miserably, at least right now. Uh, it's the same thing as the, that I explained before. It's gonna be trees that are gonna be a little bit weak. Uh, they're going to go in there and they're gonna send out the pheromone inviting more trees. Uh, and uh, uh, in this case, when the youngsters uh, become adult, they would mate within one another. So brothers and sisters are gonna mate. So they're gonna go out and they're gonna start laying eggs. So there's uh, a couple of other things that make them a lot more, a better suitable or more aggressive. Uh, so there's the side view of the insect. And I have a video later on that I'll play at the end so you can see it move. And then uh, we have the pink rat on uh, Canary Island uh, date palms. So I mentioned before, it's a fungal disease that is transmitted by the chainsaw. So in this case, the vector are people. And so these pumps are, I don't think they're there anymore, uh, but on the left, we have a nice healthy Canary Island palm. And on the right, we have one that is not healthy. So yes, it got infected. You can see on this leaf that half of it looks kind of bad and half of it is good. So that is the first symptom when half of the leaf dies, it's, you know, it's pink rot. 
gradually the leaf becomes smaller in number and less and less and less and eventually the whole crown dies once the crown dies and the palm is dead so those palms are now gone so you can see the comparison with a healthy one and i think both of them are gone now uh, next to it uh, there's uh, the top view of it uh, so you can see just the gradual decline uh, and there's a different view of that uh, and then there's going to be one of those things that we call the sudden death of trees. Uh, and so we have here sudden death of uh, Ficus nidida, uh, where we're not sure what it is. It's probably a fungus infection, a combination of several things, maybe some root pruning. Uh, but all of a sudden, trees are going to just gradually decline and then they'll die. Uh, and so here we have two of them side by side. One of them, the one with the green, is not too happy. The one in the back is dead. Uh, and so it just, just dies. Uh, and uh, it's just so sudden that it just skips every single branch and the leaves will gradually die. Uh, but it came from Australia, I think the disease, and is now here. And uh, don't be surprised if you go around the neighborhood and see some of this gigantic trees all of a sudden dead. Uh, I think there were many of these trees uh, along Lakewood Boulevard or one of those in Lakewood that are now being removed because they all died uh, because of this. Somewhere in Lakewood, Long Beach area, there was a street that was lined with them. Uh, so sudden death. Uh, here's just a, a, a bottle tree uh, with some bleeding. And uh, here is uh, that uh, uh, galls on the stem, on the roots, sorry. Uh, so caused by the bacteria. So there was probably some damage, some root pruning here. And now some of those roots that got infected have developed serious galls. Uh, again, not detrimental, but it doesn't look pretty. And the tree kept on growing, eventually it's gone. Uh, and here is a, a cherry tree, a Carolina cherry. Uh, and there's a gall right in the middle of the stem. So this is, I think this is in Signal Hill. Uh, and looking at it from different angles, it's like, how did it get there? Huh? Probably some infection somewhere, somebody jumped and uh, got it. Um, the flagging on uh, evergreen pear, so with the fire blight, it looks kind of burnt. And then also not too recently, or very recently, we have uh, a powdery mildew on Palo Verde. So here's on Coronado, Coronado and uh, there's the leaves. Again, the leaves are very small, so this is probably not going to be a serious problem. Uh, but we also now have powdery mildew on Palo Verde, and they're turning the leaves brown or white. Uh, and so I think that's the last one. But let me uh, close this and show you. Ah, that's not what I wanted. Uh, let me show you. Go back. Uh, let me show you the video of that bark beetle. Let's see if I can find it. There you go. I'm getting focused. So that beetle was uh, a Rancho Los Cerritos and it was obviously <laughs> on a sycamore. Uh, so that's what it takes. So let me play it one more time. So very small. And uh, I think I have, I do have photographs with a nice microscope that I can share with you. So you can see more of the detail. There you go. So are there any questions?
Yeah, Professor, um, a couple times you mentioned that um, grass was bad for trees once it's like too close around the trees at the trunk. Um, and then you use like weed whacking as an example. But I was curious if there are any other examples of why grass would be bad for trees. So the other problem would be if you allow the grass to grow right next to the trunk, then that is going to keep in there the trunk a lot more humid and cause rotting problem. And I think I mentioned this before about having plants, general plants around the stem of the tree or the trunk of the tree, having planters and having all of those like water gosling plants that are going to be Growing against a tree, kind of creating a microclimate is going to retain water and that's going to obviously be not good to the tree. So yeah, that would be the other reason, not just the mechanical from the weed whacker, but the rotting, the extra humidity uh, for encouraging rotting organisms to attack the trunk of the tree and helping out with that. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. All right, so I'll stop the recording and I'll see some of